<coughs> this morning uh, we are going to continue looking at um, John chapter 10. And because the second section has so much in it, um, I decided not to try to bite off the whole thing in one chunk, but rather we're going to look at um, verses 22 through 29. Uh, and that'll be more than enough to occupy our time and certainly gives to us uh, some wonderful encouragement. So let me begin by reading uh, that section, verses 22 through 29. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name these testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now, let me just read this last section, but it's not a part of what we're looking at this morning. I and the Father are one. That really introduces the next section where Jesus, again, is contending with the Jews because he's claiming to be one with the Father. He's claiming to be God. Uh, we're not going to have time to look at that particular section, but we are going to deal with these others, uh, Lord willing, this morning. Now last time, we saw Jesus drawing a contrast between himself and the leaders of Israel in, in the parable of what we call the Good Shepherd. Now they obviously thought that as the religious leaders of Israel, that they were the door that led to heaven. That through their knowledge and through their leadership, the people of Israel were to enter that kingdom through them. But we saw they were only misleading themselves and others because Jesus says I am the door Jesus is the only door he will tell us later no one comes to the Father except through him there are not many ways to God there is only one that is Jesus not the Jewish leaders not their teaching office not their leadership but rather it is Jesus and he is the one that they should have seen in the Old Testament scriptures he is the one that they should have been pointing to from the Old Testament scriptures. He is the one we need to point to because he is the only way that anyone can be reconciled with the Father. Now we saw too that they also thought they were shepherds, faithful shepherds who cared for God's sheep, for the people of Israel through their spiritual nurture and guidance, again through their teaching. But Jesus said they were only those who were taking advantage of the sheep. They were those who were in it only for what they could get out of it. Sadly, the same thing is true with many religious leaders today. The reason why they're doing what they're doing is, is because of what they hope to get out of it. Now, how can people become so deceived about themselves? Well, it's because of sin. That's what sin does. Sin makes you see bad as good, and it makes you see things good as bad. Well, Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is the one who declares to us the whole will of God, what is good. He is the faithful shepherd who didn't come to take from us, but rather he came to give, to give his life to save us and his continuing oversight, his guidance, his nurture, so that we might safely arrive in heaven. Now following from this, shortly after Jesus spoke this parable, he had another opportunity to expand on this image uh, with these Jews. Uh, they met him in the temple and asked him again whether or not he was the Messiah. Now what I want you to notice from his response is that he gives us really the answers to several important questions. Why it is he reveals himself to some but not to others. 
why some actually trust in him, some believe in him, but others refuse to do that. Uh, how we can know whether or not we really under, well, we really have believed in him. And having believed in him, how we can know that we will absolutely make it to heaven and we will never fall away. Now, first of all, why does the Lord reveal himself to some and not to others? Well, humanly speaking, it has to do with why it is we want to know who he is. Now, let's begin by looking briefly at the setting. John tells us that there was a particular event taking place in, in this context. In verse 22, he says, At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. Now this is interesting because as we search through the Old Testament, we find that there never really was a feast like this, a feast of dedication. Now it refers to the, to the dedication of the temple, but not the one Solomon built because by this time that temple had already been torn down. And it doesn't really directly refer to that temple that was rebuilt by Zerubbabel during the return. Remember the first thing they did was return and rebuild the temple. Uh, it really has to do with another event that has to do with uh, the temple. By the way, I should mention there's no record of a feast of dedication that is connected with either of these two temples. Certainly they celebrated when the, the temples were built and they established this worship of God and God had allowed them to do such great things. They rejoiced in that, they celebrated, but there wasn't an annual feast. So again, where does this feast come from? It refers to a feast that was instituted at the cleansing of Zerubbabel's temple by uh, Judas Maccabeus. We read about that in the Apocrypha. We don't believe the Apocrypha is, is scripture, but we do believe it is history. And it tells us about a time when a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes actually desolated the temple by offering on the altar, I believe himself, swine blood, which was repugnant to God and to the Jews. He defiled the temple, but Judas Maccabeus led a revolt against them, and they, they cast them, as it were, out of Jerusalem. They cleansed the temple, and when the temple was cleansed, then they instituted this feast of rededication of the temple and observed it ever since. It's much like the Feast of Purim, which if you've kept up with your reading the Bible together, you know was established during the days of Queen Esther and Mordecai when the Lord delivered them from their enemy Haman who tried to destroy all the Jews. Now God never commanded that the Feast of Purim be observed, but the people of God recognized the hand of God and they wanted to celebrate what God had done for them in history. So they instituted this feast. Now this just reminds us that the Lord doesn't have to command us to commemorate what he does for us in order for us to do it. We should remember the works of God. He is gracious. We don't want to forget even the least of his mercies but to praise him for it and some things we ought to thank him for on an annual basis. We just need to be careful that we don't require others to celebrate the things that we think they ought to celebrate if God hasn't required it. This is how church traditions actually pop up. We can celebrate them ourselves. We can keep this to ourselves or maybe a segment of the church might want to worship it but we cannot make it required, especially for salvation. We need to remember salvation is always by God's grace through faith alone and not by our traditions. Now the second thing we see here is the time of year and location. John writes in verse 23, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. It was winter, it was cold. Jesus was walking in the temple in a portion that had a cover over it and a wall enclosing it because it was cold. And that was a warmer place to walk. But the fact that he was in the temple tells us something about his audience. Who were these Jews that were asking him whether he was the Messiah? Well, most likely it was the religious leaders. And I think that explains why Jesus responds the way he does. Well, now we see why Jesus happened to be there at the Feast of Dedication in the temple. It was that he might interact with these Jewish leaders 
and point out again their sinful unbelief, but in doing so point out why they did not believe. Now we read in verse 24, the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, there's a reason why Jesus didn't speak plainly to them, because he knew why they were asking this question. He knew what they were going to do with his response to this question. Uh, they didn't really want to know so that they could trust him, so that they could believe in him. But they wanted to know so that they might accuse him to the Romans. Now we know they already wanted to kill him because he claimed to be God's son, making himself equal with God. But that was not enough to kill him legally. They wanted to kill him, but they had no law by which they could put a man to death. They needed the Romans to do it. But in order for the Romans to do it, they needed evidence that the Roman officials would actually understand as a crime punishable by death. Well, here was the one crime that they believed the Romans would recognize as one punishable by death. And that is if Jesus came out and said he was the Messiah. Remember the Jews believed the Messiah would be a political figure who was going to lead the Jews to freedom from the Romans. And from the Jews, the Romans also believed that that was the role of the Messiah. Now if Jesus admitted this, then they would have him. In doing this, of course, the leaders were only proving what Jesus said about the nature of man earlier in John 3, verses 19 and 20. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Instead of loving the Messiah and receiving him, they were looking for a reason to kill him. And the reason why they were doing that is because of the nature of man. Now, if this is the condition of the people of this world, of everyone who comes into this world apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, it's no wonder that we often feel somewhat reluctant to share the gospel with others in our conversations because we know how they're going to respond. We know what they think about the light. But you know, we understand that and we know that going in. That's not the reason why we do it. The reason why we do it is because the Lord calls us to do it and because this is the only way that the light can actually get in to their hearts and souls. Because this is the way the Lord does it. God can with infinite ease overcome any heart in a moment if that's what he wills to do. But he does it through the gospel, which is why we share the gospel with others. Because we trust that God is going to bring to himself those whom he will through this gospel. Now we're going to see more of why that is in just a moment. But now let's just notice how Jesus responds to their question. Uh, he does answer it, but not as directly as they wanted, you know, for that evidential part. He says in verse 25, I told you. Now he's answered their question. I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Now I do think Jesus told them and I do think his works also told them. Now what did Jesus tell them? Well, he was claiming to be the Messiah when he claimed to be the one who gives the Holy Spirit. Remember, he, that's what the water was representing when it was poured out at the base of the altar at the Feast of Booths, which we saw in John 7. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. I'm the one, Jesus says, who gives the Spirit. But who can do that but the Messiah? He was claiming to be the Messiah when he pointed to the lamps in the temple treasury and he says, I am the light of the world. He is the one who brings God's truth. He is the one who enlightens others, uh, that they can see the truth of God and receive it through the gospel. He is God's truth incarnate. He was claiming to be the Messiah when he told them that they were slaves to sin, 
but the Son of God could set them free. Of course, only Messiah could do that. And of course, Jesus also proved that he was the Messiah by doing things that the Messiah would do. Remember when John the Baptist sent messengers to Jesus to ask if he was the expected one. Jesus didn't say, tell John. I said, yes. But he said, go and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, I'm doing what was predicted of Messiah. I'm doing those works. Tell John what you see, what you hear. Tell him, I am the Messiah. Now, understand that when Jesus answers the question in this way, he's still doing it a bit indirectly. They want something clearer than this. And it's also interesting that I believe up to this point, the only person that Jesus was actually open with regarding his identity, apart from the disciples, was the Samaritan woman. We read in, in chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You know, the Jews would have loved to have heard that because that's exactly what they were looking for. But Jesus wasn't willing to tell them exactly that. But he was to this woman. And why? Why? What's the difference? Well, the difference is, I mean, again, consider what the woman said. I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. She was looking for him. She was waiting for him. This woman, this sinner, was looking for Jesus Christ. And yet these Jewish leaders, the shepherds of Israel, the so-called doors into the kingdom of heaven, they weren't looking for him. They just wanted to find out if Jesus was claiming to be him so they could kill him. I'd say there's a big difference between those two. If you really want to know who Jesus is, if you're really seeking after him, you are the kind of person that he is going to reveal himself to if we seek him for the right reasons. But if we're not seeking him for the right reasons, he really will not do it. The Jews simply wanted an opportunity to do away with him. But now we get to the question, why? Okay, we know the fall. Yes, we're familiar with the fall. We know what Adam and Eve's sins did to us. We know what Jesus said about the condition of their hearts. But ultimately, why is it that they didn't believe? That, that's not so much of a mystery. But why is it that there are those who actually do believe? That, that's the mystery. Well, Jesus tells us why there are those who believe and why there are those who don't believe in verse 26. Why there's a Samaritan woman, why there are Jewish leaders like this. He says to the Jewish leaders why they don't believe. He says, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Jesus is saying ultimately the reason is because some are not of his sheep while others are. And in a nutshell, because God has chosen to give some to his son while others he has not. Boy, this is a big subject. But let me just deal with a couple of things. Now think about this for a minute. To understand what Jesus is saying. Because we often understand the word sheep to refer to those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You enter into the fold. You become one of his sheep. You follow the shepherd and so forth. And certainly that is true. But we do need to understand that is not how Jesus is using the word here because if it was then when Jesus said you do not believe because you are not of my sheep he would mean you do not believe because you do not believe if the sheep are those who believe well you're not of my sheep or in other words you don't believe because you haven't believed which wouldn't make really any sense Jesus means something different here by the word sheep and he is using it as the reason why a person either believes or does not believe. Now again, as I said, we don't have time to look at this too deeply, but let me just say at least this much. 
The Bible tells us, as we've already seen Jesus telling us the condition of man as they come into the world, that we are born dead in sin. Spiritually dead, not physically dead. Spiritually dead and unable, unwilling, unable, I should say unable because unwilling to come to the shepherd. Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3 and he's addressing this to the church at Ephesus, those who were believing, but he wants to remind them that there was a time when they didn't believe and this is why. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Basically, Paul's saying the same thing that Jesus said in John chapter 3 about those who hate the light. Now, as long as we were in that condition, there's no way that we would have ever believed or chosen our, the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and followed Him because we did not want to do that, because our hearts were evil. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. This describes our condition before God had mercy on us. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now I ask you, how can anyone who is in that kind of condition ever receive the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in Him as their Lord and Savior, turn from the sins they love to the one they hate and receive him. They, they can't do it. I mean, that's exactly what our Lord is telling us. We can't. It is not those who are in the flesh are not even able to do so. They cannot please God. This isn't talking about permission. This is talking about ability. They don't have the ability because they don't have the heart. They don't have the will. They don't want to do it. So if anyone was to be saved, God had to intervene God had to do the choosing, and that's exactly what he did, which is why we read over and over in Scripture that he is always the subject of the word choosing. It's not we chose him, but he chose us. Paul writes in Romans 9, verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The Lord reserves the right to show mercy to whom he wills. And he can do that because all of mankind, by their fall into sin, have handed themselves over to judgment. All of us deserved judgment. We were the children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. But God chose to have mercy, and he can do that. Justice simply means God must give us what we deserve. We all deserve death, destruction, and damnation. And he would have been perfectly just to give that to all of us. But mercy and grace, mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And grace is giving us something good that we do not deserve. And he can do that as well. In Romans 9 verse 21, Paul writes this, Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? The potter has right over his creation. And I do believe here that uh, Paul has in mind the idea of the clay being the mass of fallen humanity. He can take some of that clay and he can make vessels for honorable use and he can take the other clay and make it vessels for common use, which means he's going to save some, but others he's going to leave to themselves. Through Adam's sin, all of us were handed over to death. That is what we deserve, eternal death. But through his grace, we have received mercy. And we do need to understand that it is God's grace. Otherwise, we will never give him the glory that he deserves for that gift of eternal life. We read a little bit earlier in our reading of God's word or in the reading of the law in Romans 8, verses 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, 
He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he, that is the son, would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, that is effectually called through the gospel. And these whom he called, he also justified because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And these whom he justified, he also glorified, which means he brought them to heaven. He has completed the work that he began, but it begins with foreknowledge. And that foreknowledge is not a foreknowledge of what we do because all God would foresee that we do apart from him would be sin, but it is a foreloving, it is a forechoosing those whom he is going to predestine and call and justify and glorify. And, and again, I want you to notice in that passage, everyone who gets in on the front makes it to the end. There's no slippage. It's not those whom he foreknew, some of them he predestined. No, all of them he predestined. Those whom he predestined, some of them he called. No, he called all of them. And not just some of those that he, that he called, he justified, but all of them and so forth, all the way to glorification. So why did the Samaritan woman receive Jesus and the Jews rejected him? Why did we receive the Lord Jesus Christ while there's so many people who scoff and balk at it and want nothing to do with him? Ultimately, it's because God chose us in eternity to be among the sheep that he would give to the shepherd for the work that he would do of redemption. We are Jesus' reward. The reason why we believe is because God chose us for that purpose and in time gave us that grace, opened our eyes so that we could see his beauty and give him glory. We need to thank God for his having mercy upon us. But let's also not forget that this does not mean we are the chosen ones and everybody else isn't. There are plenty of people out there who are God's chosen, who are part of the sheep, who will hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and will respond to the gospel because the Lord will call them through his Holy Spirit as he makes the gospel powerful for their salvation and they will come to him. That is the reason why we evangelize is because we know that the shepherd will call his sheep through the gospel. There are sheep that need to be called in and they will come when they hear their master's voice. But now we get to the next question. How can we know whether or not the Lord has chosen us? Well, we can know, this is the big question, isn't it? If God's the one who sovereignly chooses, how can I know that I'm chosen? How can I know my name is in that book? If my name's not in that book, I'll never come to Christ and I'll perish, but I don't want to perish. I want to receive Jesus Christ. I want to trust in the Savior. But my name has to be, as it were, in this book. How can I know? Well, you can know if you believe. If you trust Jesus Christ, you can know your name is written there. But how can we know that we have truly believed in the Lord Jesus? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now Jesus tells us here plainly, first of all, that the, he knows who the sheep are. He says, I know them. John Gill suggests that the reason why Jesus knows who the sheep are is because he knows those whom the Father from all eternity had promised to give to him. In other words, he has the book, and he knows the name of his sheep, and he recognizes them when he sees them. And that, that certainly is a possibility. However, that doesn't really help us know whether we're sheep. He knows who his sheep are, but we still need to know whether we are his sheep. So how can we know whether we are his sheep? Well, we can know by our fruits. We can know by the way we live. Jesus says in Matthew 7.20, you will know them by their fruits. Well, what fruit should we expect to see in our own lives if we have believed in the Savior and we are his called chosen ones. Jesus says this, my sheep hear my voice. If we are his sheep, we will recognize the voice of the shepherd in the gospel and we will respond to that gospel in faith and repentance. In other words, we will believe. We will also hear his voice in his word. And when we hear the shepherd telling us this is the way walk in it, we will listen and we will do 
what he says. We will, in other words, follow him. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So if you've heard the voice of the shepherd in, in the gospel, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're following him because you hear him speaking to you in his word, then you can know that you are one of his sheep. Now finally, if we are his sheep, what can we expect from the shepherd? What is it that he gives to his sheep? Well, the most important thing is we can know that he will bring us to heaven. And how can we know that? Well, because Jesus tells us as much in verse 28. And these are the most, these are the, the clearest perhaps, the most powerful words that have to do with eternal security that I can imagine. Jesus says this, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If we are Christ's sheep, he has given us eternal life. Eternal life, of course, is more than just a duration of life. It is a relationship with the Father and the Son, but it is one that takes place, or lasts, I should say, forever in, in heaven, in a world that is full of love and beauty and glory. That's something Jesus says, I give to my sheep and they will have forever. He says, if we are his sheep, we will never perish, which means that we're not going to fall away from him, not fully and finally, not fully, we're never going to go all the way away from him, and not finally, however far we may fall away from him, the Lord will always bring us back. Our sins are not going to rear up and grab a hold of us and drag us down into the pit and destroy us. We will never perish, we will never go down into hell because all of our sins are forgiven once and for all in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will make it to heaven. And then Jesus deals with another possibility. Can somebody take us away? Our sins can't do it. Is there something else that can? No, Jesus says nothing can take us away. That was the purpose behind reading Paul's letter to the Romans. Nothing in heaven or earth, nothing created will ever be able to separate us. Jesus says this is true because of verse 29. My Father, who has given them to me, Remember the one, the father has, has chosen some to give to his son as a reward for his, for his redemption. Those are the sheep. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. You see, if we are what the father has determined to give to his son as a reward for the work that he undertook, then there's nothing that's going to be able to thwart the Father from actually carrying out that blessing and that reward for his Son. There is no one that can stop him. Uh, certainly Satan would like to stop him, and that's what Paul addresses in Romans chapter 8. But that's why he says there's nothing created, and there's certainly nothing else but God that, that exists but what God has created. Nothing can take us away from him. And by the way, we will not want to get away from him. We will not want to escape him. Some think, well, yeah, no one can take us away, but we can, we can get away if we want to get away. Well, no, you, you can't. And the reason why you can't is because you won't want to, because the Lord has changed your heart, and you want the shepherd. You hear his voice, and you want to follow him. You may fall away for a time, but not fully, but the Lord will always bring you back. So we can know that we are going to make it to heaven if we know that we belong to him. And we can know that we belong to him if we hear his voice and we follow him. Is that true of you this morning? Is, is that what's going on in your life? Is that what you're experiencing? Are you one of his sheep and you know that you are because you hear the voice of the shepherd and you're following him? If that is true of you, then you will never perish. You will make it to heaven. Jesus has given you not temporary life, but eternal life. And if that is true of you, thank the Lord for his mercy. But if it isn't true of you, then listen to the shepherd as he mercifully calls you again this morning by his gospel. 
He says, believe on me and you will be saved. You know, the Lord says in his word that if somebody comes to him and, and wants salvation, Jesus will never turn them away. He will receive them. And the reason why he will is because the Father is drawing them. There's a reason why you want it. There's a reason why you want to come to him and receive it. And that should be an encouragement to you, that if you do want it, and you want to come to Jesus and receive it, that he's not going to turn you away because you're one of those that the Father is giving to him. If you will look to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, he will save you, and he will give you all these things we've just seen about. He will bring you safely to heaven if you come to him and he will never lose you the good shepherd will never let go of you so if you haven't come to Jesus come to him if you want Jesus come to him trust him receive him and he will save you well let's bow in prayer and let's either thank the Lord for his mercies upon us or pray that if we haven't come to the Savior that we would do so now